Good morning. Welcome to this conversation with the Health First Fund, part of the All in Chicago 2020 virtual event series. My name is Laura Cerisi Starr, and I am the Director of Development and Communications at Community Health. Community Health is the largest volunteer based free health center in the United States. We provide primary and specialty care, prescription medications, mental health and dental services, health education and lab testing, including COVID testing on the west side of Chicago. Our patients have no health insurance and we provide all of our services to them at no charge. We do this with the support of over 1000 volunteers, partnerships with dozens of institutions and donations from generous people like you. Thank you for being here and for supporting community health. I would especially like to recognize our many sponsors who are supporting this year's All In series, including Baxter, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois, Abvi, Lundbeck, the Joseph and Bessie Feinberg Foundation, West Monroe Partners, and many others. I encourage you to visit our website, allin-chicago.org, to see the complete list of sponsors, read the bios for our incredible speakers today, and check out the rest of the month's events. Finally, I want to recognize this year's All In Executive Leadership Council. We have the privilege of having four outstanding leaders serving on the council this year. Their great insights and support have been instrumental in bringing this year's series to life. Thank you to Joe Flanagan, Kimberly Hobson, Stacey Lindau, and John Maples for your contributions this year. And now I would like to introduce you to one of those Executive Leadership Council members, Joe Flanagan. Joe is the CEO of Acquirent and Chair of the Board for the Cook County Health Foundation. Thank you for being here, Joe. Oh, Joe, you're muted. I was, is that, is that? There you go, now I can it? hear you, yep. Just seeing if you were watching, Laura. Um, thanks, Laura, I'm proud to be here today and be part of the All In Chicago 2020 series. The goal of the All In Chicago series is to bring leaders together from many different industries and segments of our population to talk about how we can work together to ensure every resident has access to the right care in the right place at the right time. While we're doing things a little differently with a virtual broadcast this year, Community Health has been hosting these conversations around access to healthcare in Chicago since 2015. This year, as we're living with a global pandemic, the conversation on access feels more relevant than ever. At Cook County Health, we care for over a half million local residents, many of whom are uninsured or on Medicaid. In addition to the myriad barriers that often keep these individuals from accessing care, COVID-19 and racial unrest across the country have made it even more difficult to ensure that our Chicago residents are getting both the preventative and emergency care that they need. The first, uh, the Health First Fund was created to respond to these issues, specifically facing Black and Latinx communities in Chicago. HFF envisions a future where health access is universal. Quality of life is central and integrated service delivery is backed by just policies that are informed by community stakeholders. HFF is incubating three pilot projects, which you'll hear about today, focused on community health centers as innovative hubs of health transformation. These pilots strive to eliminate racial health disparities and improve health outcomes in Black, Latinx, and in the uninsured communities in our regions. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's conversation, Jackie Jacobs. Jackie is a director of evaluation at the Sinai Urban Health Institute, the research arm of Sinai Health Systems. Sinai Urban Health Institute seeks to achieve health equity among communities through excellence and innovation in data-driven research, interventions, evaluation, and community engagement. I'm really looking forward to learning more about these innovative pilots how they'll shape access to healthcare. So with no further ado, I'll hand things over to Jackie. Thanks for being here, Jackie. 
Thanks, Joe, um, and thank you all for joining us here today. Um, thank you to the All in Chicago team um, for having us. We're really excited to um, be able to share this today um, and for Community Health for inviting us today. Um, so as Joe said, I am Jackie Jacobs. I'm the Director of Evaluation at the Sinai Urban Health Institute, and I will be moderating our conversation about the Health First Fund today. So as the COVID-19 pandemic began to unfold earlier this year, it illuminated deeply rooted structural inequities in Illinois' public health infrastructure. These inequities led to a disproportionate increase of COVID-19 positivity and mortality rates among Black, Latinx, and uninsured communities in the Chicagoland area. With just under 75,000 positive cases reported to date in Chicago, 75% of these are among Black and Latinx residents. Addressing decades of disinvestment in community health and catalyzing systemic changes requires long-term structural solutions that come from the ingenuity and vision of the very communities who are most impacted. The Health First Fund was created in response to the twin public health crises we are facing, COVID-19 and systemic racism. Regional philanthropic organizations pooled their resources to create the fund, which is being incubated at the Michael Reese Health Trust. Over the next five years, the Health First Fund will support innovative community-led demonstration pilots that can be replicated and or scaled to eliminate health inequities and improve health in Black, Latinx, and uninsured communities in our collective regions. In the first five years of the program's life, we aim to raise five to $10 million to support multiple hubs of health transformation. Today, you will hear from the first iteration of Health Hubs, a cohort of community health centers. From the start, evaluation and policy support will be wrapped around each pilot and across the cohorts of the fund to elevate emerging evidence that will be used to inform policies and just in systems level change. As you're going here today, in the most challenging moments of COVID-19, each health center found ways to implement innovative methods of whole person care in order to best serve their communities and develop a new normal. As these pandemics catapult us into the future of healthcare delivery. As the lead evaluator, my team and I will be building an evaluation framework that will guide us through a process of measuring change and understanding impact at the individual, organizational, and community levels. To do this, we're going to work very closely with the pilot leads through individual meetings and a facilitated learning collaborative for each hub. And through that work and with the close guidance of a community advisory council, we're going to develop metrics and a dashboard to track our progress. We will work closely with our policy partners, who you will also hear from today, to ensure growth and sustainability and leverage the resources and relationships of our participating funders. Racial equity principles will be foundational for this work and how we describe our impact. So as we head into the panel discussion, I'm just gonna ask our panelists, as it's time for you to speak, to turn on your camera so we can see you. And then one other quick house, housekeeping item is this conversation is happening live. So please make sure to submit any questions that you have for our panelists. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can um, during you know, the, the rest of the presentation. Um, so please just feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So with that, um, let's take a look at the next slide. Oh, here we go. Um, so these are all of our presenters um, that are gonna be on the panel today. So we have Jessica Bolin, Director of Behavioral Health at Esperanza Health Center. Stephanie Wilding, CEO of Community Health, Kenneth Burnett, who is the CEO of Christian Community Health Center, and then representing our policy focus, who will kick off our discussion, is Stephanie Altman, Director of Healthcare Justice and Senior Director of Policy at the Shriver Center on Policy Law. So Stephanie, if you want to unmute and share your camera and give us a little overview of the policy landscape. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Stephanie Altman, as um, introduced from the Shriver Center on Poverty Law. I'm the director of the healthcare justice team at the Shriver Center. Um, the Shriver Center Health Work focuses on expanding healthcare access through policy advocacy, legal representation, and training and technical assistance to on the ground frontline providers, like many of the providers that you'll hear from today. We center race equity in all of our work and believe that poverty is inextricably tied to racial and ethnic discrimination. 
We advocate for anti-racist health policies and to reduce biases in healthcare coverage. Our overall aim is to reduce health disparities and to ensure that everyone has affordable, quality healthcare coverage and can access the care that they need to improve their healthcare out health outcomes. To that end, we administer Health Hub, which is a professional training and technical assistance center on Medicaid um, healthcare coverage and other programs that are designed to address the social determinants of health. We also administer Get Care Illinois, a hub for consumers to access healthcare coverage and information in five languages, the top five languages spoken in the area. Please feel free to join us at povertylaw.org, helphub at poverty.org, or getcareillinois.org for your consumers. Shriver Center is really excited to be invited here today, so thank you, and to work with the Health First Fund's inaugural projects as they implement their models. The Health First Fund projects will demonstrate best practices in their field as they strive to find innovative solutions to overcome systemic barriers and to reduce racial and poverty health inequality. The Shriver Center will be working with the projects to lift up these learnings and to advocate for policy solutions to implement, expand, and sustain these innovations. For example, the Shriver Center is advocating for policies that implement and fund telehealth expansions in Medicaid and in private insurance, both to respond to COVID right now in the emergency, as well as to sustain these flexibilities for the future. The Shriver Center is also advocating for policies that break down the barriers to accessing care for the populations we serve, including those who lack transportation, Childcare, especially right now when childcare is an extremely difficult issue for many families, income and social supports that are necessary to be able to get to an in person health appointment or to be able to access healthcare through other means. Our policy advocacy is always grounded in our connection to best practice models, like the ones that you'll hear about and learn about today, so that we work together to achieve better health outcomes for the populations we serve. Thank you for inviting me. Great, thank you so much for that overview. Um, and now I'm just gonna, we're gonna jump right into our pilot organizations. I will call on each of you and if you could provide a high level description of what your organization will be doing and why this matters in the context of systemic racism and the health of our communities. Um, that would be great to get us started. So I'm gonna ask, um, Jessica from Esperanza, if you wouldn't mind unmuting camera and sharing a little bit about Esperanza's pilot. Hi, yes, thank you so much. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so I am Jessica Boland and uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health at Esperanza. Um, I know many on the call probably are familiar with us, but for those who aren't, um, we are a federally qualified health center in FQHC. And we have four um, primary care clinic locations um, on the southwest side of Chicago. So that includes the Marshall Square, Pilsen, North and South Lawndale neighborhoods, as well as Brighton Park, Gage Park. And we're also um, as far south as Marquette. We have a school-based health center down at Marquette Elementary School, which is a K through eight CPS neighborhood school. Um, as an FQHC, we provide, of course, primary care medical care services, so adult medicine, pediatrics, um, obstetrics, and gynecology. And then embedded within, we have um, an integrated behavioral health team, um, which is important to know about because that is, um, that is the heart and soul of this project that we are doing with HFF here. So prior to the pandemic and prior to um, COVID and all the all the things that have happened since um, you know, the beginning of this year. Um, the way that Esperanza's behavioral health team has worked is that we had um, fully licensed behavioral health providers, so clinicians, you'll hear me kind of use those words interchangeably, assigned to each of our four clinic sites. Um, so the number of clinicians um, depended on the size of each specific clinic and the patient population that we have there. Um, I also think it's worth mentioning that um, as an FQHC and as a community organization, Esperanza has historically um, really tailored itself to serving and meeting the needs of the Hispanic Latino community here in Chicago. So um, at least 75%, if not more, of Esperanza's patient population is Spanish speaking only or prefers to speak in Spanish, which means that every single one of our 
patient interfacing staff must be bilingual, fully bilingual in Spanish and English. Um, many of um, our, especially our adult patients, are uninsured um, and it largely has to do with immigration status that they don't qualify for other kinds of insurance. Um, but that being said, we are available to the community at large and we do recognize that, um, you know, our doors are open to all, not just um, our Hispanic Latino populations, but historically, um, that is really where we've um, focused our values, focused our mission and really being a place where um, folks in the southwest side of Chicago can come get medical care, high quality medical care and behavioral health care, um, regardless of ability to pay. Um, which is, I know, very similar to the um, other organizations that are um, present here today. So with HFF and our pilot project, what we um, are looking to do here is we need to expand our behavioral health services. That's a really broad way to define it, but that's what we need to do. The big why? Um, well, speaking to kind of the broader context of health disparities that we know exist, especially kind of thinking about uh, policies and the way that reimbursement works, there's still a really big gap in the term in the um, in regards to the reimbursement and the funding that we receive for behavioral health services. So behavioral health includes mental health services, counseling, psychiatry, compared with our medical visits. So um, as a point of comparison, um, a medical visit, we usually get reimbursed somewhere around the $130 mark. Um, a behavioral health visit is usually only reimbursed at about $50. So that makes it a little bit more challenging for us to find ways to sustain our behavioral health programming, our department, um, and really make sure that we have the number of clinicians and providers to meet the need. Um, it's again, of course, also a secondary challenge, um, although a worthwhile one of making sure that we do have quality providers available at Esperanza. Um, so again, you know, not just in terms of credentials, but also in terms of their ability to really understand our patient population, understand our community, and of course, you know, speak, speak their language and really understand their experience. Um, so what we have seen since COVID, and um, I don't know that this is going to be much as of a surprise to folks that are here on this panel, given, you know, the interest in um, health equity and, you know, health justice. Um, we have seen a absolute surge, a huge, huge spike in demand and, of course, need for behavioral health services. Um, certainly with the onset of the pandemic, um, our patients, um, you know, they were already the most vulnerable. They were already incredibly underserved and disadvantaged um, for a lot of reasons. And that has only gotten worse, right? Like the, you know, the spotlight has only been shown brighter on the different disparities and struggles that um, a lot of people are dealing with um, all over the city and um, certainly in the neighborhoods and patient populations that we serve. So we have, um, we have both adults, adolescents, children. We see people of all ages in our behavioral health department struggling with um, absolutely increased mental health needs. Anxiety has been, um, you know, going through the roof for a lot of our, our patients. We've been seeing that um, other existing mental health conditions like depression and mood disorders, um, a significant um, proportion, a significant percentage of our patients um, were already experiencing um, disproportionate amounts of trauma and have, you know, disorders relevant to trauma, such as post-traumatic stress disorder. They're exposed to community violence. We piled on the pandemic and all the changes that happened, right, um, like our essential workers being on the front lines and not having adequate PPE. Um, we saw, of course, at the beginning of the pandemic that um, African American, our Black and our Brown patients were being, you know, were making up the bulk of our positivity rate. Um, and so our, you know, patients are experiencing grief and loss and trauma related to the pandemic and family members that have been lost or family members that have been impacted by um, contracting COVID-19. And then, um, you know, as it happens with, you know, this um, massive shift with, you know, what we're calling civil unrest, especially in the wake of um, uh, the police brutality that we've seen that has impacted our community um, before this year, certainly, um, you know, being exacerbated this year. And we are, you know, we do our best, but we're not able to meet that need, especially as that need has been increasing. We've um, 
launch telehealth like most um, healthcare entities have um, to meet the needs of the pandemic. Um, you know, but we also see that our patients have, you know, there's a technology divide, right? Um, not everybody has the technology to access things like, you know, video conferencing software and, or not everybody has high speed internet. And so we've been really trying to fill in those gaps about utilizing telehealth, meeting the needs of our patients and providing that high quality mental health care. So our pilot program um, was purposely made pretty broad. Um, what we want to do is we want to bring on more providers, you know, recruit and hire more uh, mental health providers to help ease the burden and meet the demand. And then um, to kind of tailor that down, this project is going to allow us to definitely examine our existing workflows, tweak and um, develop uh, newer and more enhanced workflows. Um, and we also want to take a deep dive in looking at our delivery of telehealth. I think like a lot of people, you know, we had a dive in kind of head first straight into the deep end. And now we really want to kind of take a step back, zoom out, look at what's going on and keep telehealth around because we know it's really useful, but also expand on, um, you know, how it's benefiting folks, who it's benefiting and how we can really enhance it. So um, I think that is probably the long and short of what we are looking to do here at S. Esperanza. Um, and I am looking forward to taking questions and speaking with my fellow panelists. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, Steph, I'm going to kick it over to you if you want to tell us about Community Health Pilot Project. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, I'm Steph Wilding. I'm the CEO here at Community Health. I'll skip the overview about Community Health since you all had the opportunity to learn more about who we are and what we do at the top of this session. Um, so sort of laying the foundation, um, when the shelter in place occurred, um, all healthcare providers, including Esperanza and Christian Community and Community Health, we all had to rethink how to get to our patients, how to continue to provide care to them. Um, when we couldn't move in the same way that we had before. And really what Community Health is doing in our pilot project is building upon this concept. So specifically what we're doing in our pilot project is exploring space and place for point of care. We've learned a lot during the pandemic. Um, as Jessica mentioned, um, quickly implementing telemedicine, for example. And what we've learned from there is that we have this opportunity to no longer um, look at our patients and say, here's an appointment, now figure out how to come to us. We can now say, how can we come to you? Let's meet our patients where they're at. And so community health is gonna focus on two specific areas uh, around rethinking space and place for point of care. So first, um, as Jessica had mentioned on the behavioral health side at Esperanza, um, we're gonna be implementing telemedicine fully into our model of care. And because Community Health is a volunteer-based organization where the bulk of our care is provided through volunteer providers, uh, the full implementation of telehealth allows us to do a few things. One, obviously it allows us again to meet our patients where they are, which could be on their phone. These are my cute dogs. Um, could be on their telephone. Um, it could be on their computer um, and meet them really where they are. So rather than having to find transportation to get to work, take off time for work, buy childcare, as Stephanie mentioned, which is very challenging right now, we're gonna move to where the patient is through technology. This will also open up the opportunity for us to expand not only access to primary care, but also specialty care services that may have been difficult for uninsured low-income patients to access prior. And, and, and finally, because again, Community Health is a volunteer-based organization, we now have an opportunity to rethink how we recruit our volunteers. Previously, we needed our volunteers to physically be able to come on site um, at our location in Humboldt Park. Now we can rethink that and identify ways to recruit volunteers, not only from throughout Chicago, but even potentially throughout the country. So telemedicine and how we interact with our patients is certainly one of the key elements that we'll be exploring, just like Esperanza. But the big part of our project is gonna be around developing community-based microsites. These microsites will be um, telehealth hubs that are co-located within community organizations in the neighborhoods and communities where our patients live and work. As Jessica mentioned, for example, the digital divide is an issue. So if we wanna meet our patients where they are, placing a microsite in the communities where they live and work without them having to access the technology on their own phone or through their own internet will allow us to um, expand telemedicine while also 
making sure our patients have access to care. So at these community-based microsites, our patients will receive an assisted virtual visit by a medical assistant community health worker. That individual will take their vitals, do point of care labs. They will virtually room the patient for a telemedicine visit with a provider who could be at our headquarters location. They could be at one of our large academic medical centers right here in Chicago, but they could be anywhere in the country through our national volunteer recruitment program. And what this does is allows us to to, in a cost-efficient manner, expand our geographic impact to, again, meet our patients where they live and work, reducing all of the barriers they may experience to accessing care, including the technology barrier. We're also really excited to be exploring medication access through these microsites as well, by potentially testing out um, what we're calling medication vending machines to ensure that our microsites are truly a one-stop shop for our patients for all of the care that they need. And finally, we're planning to open these microsites, as I mentioned, to community organizations. So these are organizations that already exist within the community, already known and trusted by the community, and are already addressing many of the social determinants of health that our patients experience, such as food insecurity, housing, child care, employment. Um, so our hope is that by co-locating within these community organizations, community health will also be taking a more proactive, direct approach to social determinants of health by enhanced collaborations and partnerships with these community organizations. So the theme of our work is really rethinking space and place for point of care so that we're, we're now meeting our patients where they are rather than the way that it was before the pandemic. Great, thanks Steph. And finally, Kenneth from Christian Community Health Center, can you share with us a little bit about your pilot project? Yes, thank you. Um, Again, my name is Ken Burnett, the CEO at Christian Community Health Center. And at Christian Community Health Center, we provide integrated health and housing services on the far south side of Chicago. In terms of our housing, we have over 300 scattered site apartments throughout the city of Chicago, as well as mixed income housing and transitional housing for um, intact families. For this initiative, we are, um, Seeking, we, we secured fund for our population health collaborative, which is comprised of five federally qualified health centers located on the south side of Chicago. Collectively, we serve more than 82,000 individuals, of which 62,000 are part of a Medicaid plan. The PHC has three overarching goals to deliver a collaborative health management program, which would bring clinical, financial, and operational data together from across the collective community health centers to deliver actionable analytics based upon findings of specialty care to help improve efficiency and patient care. And three, to develop specialty care and subspecialty care networks dedicated to improving quality and managed care. So the Health First funds are being used to build a scalable infrastructure to support population health management platform across multiple populations based upon current and potential patient mix and care patterns to address uh, specialty care needs and capacity. And through this um, project, we want to implement a model in action based upon findings and approach for a sustainable population health strategy aimed to address in inequities in access to and utilization of specialty care services for medically underserved and vulnerable population in safety net settings. Lastly, we wanna extend collaboration, partnership or joint venture models to scale the solution to hospitals and managed care organizations, specifically our Medicaid plans using defined quality metrics and indicators to improve health outcomes and access to health equity. Thank you. Great, thank you. So let's jump into some questions. Again, I welcome anyone to drop questions into the Q&A. Um, you know a little bit more about the pilot sites now, so maybe that got some ideas floating. So no, he no hesitation, no bad questions. Um, please let us know what you wanna hear about. Um, so as you all are thinking and submitting some questions, I will kick us off with one. So you all, everyone here on the panel, is pretty familiar with grants, initiating new programs, but this one is quite different. 
Um, can you speak to that? What's so different and novel about this approach? Yeah, Jackie. Feel free I, whoever wants to get us started. Yeah, Jackie, I'll jump in actually um, on this one because I'm really excited about the Health First Fund, obviously for, for the work that we're going to do, but also in the approach that the fund is taking. Um, you know, all of us here on the panel can certainly speak to being given the opportunity to receive a grant, carry out a project, kind of go at it alone, report back to the funder, um, and really have it be sort of this siloed approach that ends up being a one-off um, attempt at building greater access, or improving outcomes, and certainly is meaningful and impactful. Um, but there's an opportunity to do more. And, and I think both you, Jackie, and Stephanie have, have mentioned this a little bit at the top of the session, which is about the evaluation and policy support that goes alongside this um, opportunity. So in addition from um, Community Health having a chance to work with Christian Community and Esperanza as partners, as technical assistants, um, you know, friends, we're really gonna be working together, learning together um, and building something together. Um, our learnings are being supported through the Sinai Urban Health Institute, who really is a thought partner, a technical assistance partner, and an evaluation partner to ensure that the work that we're doing and what we're building can be scalable and replicated elsewhere, whether in Chicago or throughout the state or even beyond, which I think is, is really unique as opposed to the one-off grant approach that, that usually we experience. And then the other piece is the policy component. Um, I know that we're going to learn a lot through this, whether it's the reimbursement that Jessica mentioned at the top of the session, um, or whether it's finding new and creative ways to provide care to uninsured Illinoisans throughout the state, ensuring that that's baked into not only one-off changes with each of our projects and our organizations, but also system changes. Um, when we talk, about, I think all of our projects aim to achieve um, equity in healthcare access, which is about the fair distribution of, of healthcare resources, which we can't do just as the three of us, right? Well, we're, we're going to have a great impact. I know it's going to be truly incredible what we're going to be able to achieve within our three projects, but being able to have system-wide changes that are supported not only through SUHI, but also through the Shriver Center are going to ensure a long-term impact and a system-based impact so that we're actually building true equity in healthcare. That was great. That was very inspiring. And I can um, just pick up for a second, two Stephanie's in a row. Um, thank you. I, I think it is really unique to have policy advocacy in at the very beginning included from the outset and I really thank the Michael East Health Trust and the other funders who have put this together and the Health First Fund for doing that and for us to be able to learn Stephanie from you as well um, and Kenneth and Jessica and to be able to see what providers and community members are experiencing as you you know implement the projects um, it really helps us figure out what policies are needed to sustain those flexibilities. When we talk to policymakers, people in the governor's office and legislators and other policymakers, that's what they look for. They want to know from us, you, you know, did you just make up this policy idea in a vacuum or is this something that you learned on the ground that you learn from the people that you um, work with every day, including the providers and the clients and patients you work with, so that the policies make sense, so that the solutions that we're proposing are grounded in something that will really work. So I thank you so much, kind of Jessica and Stephanie, for what you're doing to make sure that those policies um, make sense. Yeah, no, thank you to both Stephanie's. Um, I think the only things I would want to add, because I wholeheartedly agree with all of that, um, we are also have been supported by this HFF um, opportunity and um, this funding because it's really been novel to have um, a lot of bandwidth and a lot of latitude to kind of um, you know, have an idea, have a project, have a proposal, know what we want to do, but not be kind of, you know, really reined in, like, you know, Stephanie, uh, Steph from Community Health mentioned about being siloed, um, and, you know, we don't have to deal with that. Um, we also are able to kind of learn, right? This gives us the flexibility to learn as we're kind of going along um, without having to kind of magically come up with predetermined outcomes. Um, we're able to kind of, um, not even kind of, we're able to 
you know, see what's going to be working. You know, some things that we anticipate at the beginning might become irrelevant and we might learn new things as we're going along. And I think that is so incredibly inv um, invaluable, um, especially for the type of work that we're all doing as organizations serving the community. You know, this is kind of, I agree with all of the comments that were shared by everyone. Um, I think this process is truly a partnership between the, the um, with Help First Fund and I'm very excited about you know, working with the various um, organizations around impact evaluation and truly policy change. And I truly believe that what we're doing and what we're seeking to accomplish will make a difference and be very impactful in community, particularly those communities that are vulnerable. And so I look forward to the, the continued work that we're doing today. Great, thank you all. So I think you started to touch on this a bit, but can you each share with us what you hope to achieve as a result of your pilot program and how your organization's vision will help lead to sustained change for Chicagoans? We're not just talking about change during COVID now. This is going to be long-term change. So tell us a little bit about how you see that. Jessica, why don't you take a Sure, I'll start um, since I started at the beginning as well. Um, so, you know, how this is going to sustain long term change, right? So, as I mentioned, um, you know, at the very beginning when I was describing Esperanza and the overview of our pilot project, um, our focus is on meeting the mental health needs, right? Um, so, yes, we do know that, you know, there's an immediate need here with just, you know, not just, but with COVID happening. And we also know that this is going to continue, if not get worse, right, in the long run. This isn't going away. So we really want to be able to, um, you know, break the stigma that exists. Like, so, you know, in the mental health, uh, especially community-based mental health um, or mental health services that are available to the underserved and the disadvantaged, um, we have been long aware, any of us who work in healthcare, we're aware of that. We know that, right? But not everybody else knows that, right? That's not something that always gets um, a, shot light, a spotlight shown on it, right? It doesn't always get highlighted um, by the media, by the big wigs, by, you know, the other people that are, you know, in government, right? Um, it's something that's been, you know, the first to be on the chopping block for certain administration's budgets, right? So what we're really looking to do is come up with some really good workflows, best practices to continue to provide um, that service not only within our organization, but then also make sure that we're collaborating and learning with organizations that are similar to us, that are different from us, also doing this work, and making sure it's as prioritized as our physical and medical health care, and that we're um, trauma-informed, right, so that we're also making sure to address the trauma, the disparities, like the things that are impacting Chicagoans, underserved Chicagoans, racial minorities in Chicago, um, that's what our overall goal is, which, um, you know, I'm not going to bore you by listing off Esperanza's missions and value statements, but, um, you know, that's at the heart of what we aim to do. So um, long and short, that's what we're excited to do and how we hope to create sustained change here in Chicago and for our vulnerable residents. Yeah, and if I could actually um, add to, to what Jessica was saying. So, um, Esperanza is going to be developing the workflows and really the best practices around the behavioral health side. And community health is gonna be tackling the primary care and specialty care side of things. And what we're really excited about is we're all actually gonna be using the same system. So we're gonna be able to join forces and really um, develop a comprehensive best practices approach around telemedicine, um, which I know um, we're, we're all very excited about. Also for community health project, um, I think our, our ultimate goal is about, particularly with the microsites, building something that is going to be able to be replicated, um, not only in Chicago, but really throughout the state. Um, the, before the pandemic, the rate of uninsured was already rising um, for a myriad of reasons. And obviously we all know now, um, I think the last stat I read for the country was about 5.4 million people lost their health insurance throughout the country. Um, and we know hundreds of thousands in the state of Illinois have lost their coverage, many without the ability to enroll in Medicaid, um, which is leaving a lot of people in the gap. And so community health's approach is to build sustainable, cost-effective, high-quality access points for the uninsured um, through these microsites. 
our plan is to really build the best practices around this um, from the, you know, the boring stuff, the equipment types, to the workflows, to the recruitment strategies um, that can then be translated and scaled up throughout Chicago um, through community health leadership, but also by partnering with other free and charitable clinics throughout the state of Illinois to really increase access points for low-income uninsured Illinoisans in a very cost-effective um, and efficient manner. Um, and so that's certainly something that we are, are, are really, really looking forward to, to that progress and that process as well. Yeah. I think for Christian Community Health Center and for the Population Health Collaborative, you know, we're seeking to embrace a new uh, strategic direction. I think there's three areas that the PHC is really focused on and that is to expand capacity to reach um, new patients, um, strengthen controls, um, that lead to safe and quality, and quality services. And the most important part, I think, advanced data structures to demonstrate performance. Um, it's very unique to have five FQACs collaborating on the south side of Chicago and working closely together. Um, as we look at the south side and we see some of the challenges and some of the um, soft spots in our ecosystem uh, for healthcare on the south side. And I think through this collaboration um, and this partnership with HFF and um, with my colleagues um, here on the panel, it allows to respond uh, to increased demands and changes in the uh, healthcare environment. Great, thanks. And so I know part of this is my team's job, but can you tell us a little bit about how you intend to measure progress? Um, we've talked to some of you, some conversations are still coming in the future, but talk a little bit about what success looks like to you and um, maybe highlight a couple of key metrics that you're going to use to track that. Yeah, Jackie, I, I love this question um, because I, I, I know that we all have, right now what our vision is around what our, what our impact will be. And as was mentioned earlier in the panel, through our partnership with SUI, we're gonna continue adapting and growing how we envision our impact. So for Community Health Project, we really see our impact being threefold. So first, um, we're hoping to build more equitable healthcare access. So we anticipate increasing the number of people served. But we also anticipate um, a shift in the percentage of individuals who are receiving care in the communities where they live and work. That's something we're hoping to track, um, which we don't currently necessarily track um, in the same way that we will once we have some microsites in place. We also hope to see an increase in access to various specialty care, particularly specialty care that can be provided exclusive th exclusively through telemedicine. We also hope to enhance the patient experience. Um, you know, there's some technical things in there like that the healthcare people talk about, reducing no-show rates. So for those on, who are listening who um, don't spend a lot of time looking at no-show rates, um, this is just what it sounds like. It's the percentage of individuals who don't show up for their appointment, don't call to cancel, et cetera. So we anticipate seeing that decrease, which actually impacts our, our access um, goal as well. Um, so we anticipate seeing that decrease, and in fact, we've already seen that impact in our initial iterations of telemedicine implementation. We also um, anticipate the patient will have a better experience by spending, for example, less time on site at our microsite. So an improved, what we call cycle time. But we also want to figure out how we can track um, some, some less technical aspects of the patient experience. So for example, at Community Health, one of the measures we currently track is, you know, has being a patient at Community Health um, decreased the amount of time you had to take off of work or school due to being sick? Well, we want to kind of flip that question a little bit on its head and try to track, has being a patient at Community Health and accessing either telehealth or a microsite reduced the amount of time you've had to take off from work or school in order to see the doctor? So really capturing that, that point that I said at the top of the panel, which is how are we meeting our patients where they are? Um, and then finally, we anticipate seeing an increase in quality of life measures and various health outcomes. Obviously, like the other um, panelists today, we're gonna be focusing heavily on chronic disease management. Um, so really looking at those measures that impact our diabetic patients, our hypertensive patients. 
Um, but we also want to find ways to capture what I had mentioned about having a more proactive and direct approach around social determinants of health. And this is really, um, you know, one of those measures that we're going to work with Suhi to, to really define what that outcome is. But, you know, for example, how can we capture increased access to food, which if we're exploring the food as medicine concept is really, really key to our project and also impacts, for example, chronic disease management for our diabetic patients. Um, and so we really see ours as threefold. So the, the more equitable access, enhanced patient experience, and increased quality of life and health outcomes. Um, I will jump off from Steph um, there. So um, at Esperanza, um, I will be very candid as a panelist that in my work as a director of behavioral health, um, one of my kind of running jokes is that um, I'm very data adverse, um, at least in kind of like the traditional like statistics and, you know, data collection and reporting. Um, however, I absolutely recognize and respect its importance. So that being said, and that's another reason why I've been so appreciative of HFF is it's really given us um, that leeway to kind of really think through what we want to measure, what we want to track, and what's going to actually be really meaningful and letting us know that we are having the impact we want to have. Um, so as previously mentioned at Esperanza, our project is um, really focusing in on the behavioral health programming and then also the telehealth telecounseling um, service provision that we have. Um, so things that we are looking to measure and um, kind of like Steph said, we have our meeting, our big meeting with SUI later this week. So we don't have our exact specifics, um, you know, all targeted and, you know, um, identified, but what we are really excited about and what we are looking to um, really deep dive in and hone in on. Um, we want to look at, you know, the analyze and take a look at the difference between access to telehealth versus, you know, the traditional model of coming on site to receive care. So for instance, does telehealth improve access to behavioral health services um, as evidenced by the greater compliance with visits, right? So Steph mentioned about, you know, looking at no-show rates. I can tell you anecdotally and looking at our patient access data, we absolutely saw, you know, a really big difference in behavioral health. Our no-show rate dropped really significantly when we implemented telehealth. So we wanna to continue to look and track those measures and really see what the long and the short term is gonna, is gonna tell us, right? What the numbers are gonna tell us. Um, really taking a look at our patient satisfaction in the delivery of telehealth as compared to um, in-person on-site only. Um, so taking a look at our patient, our existing patient satisfaction metrics and surveys, and then also being creative and um, getting some more qualitative, I think, feedback from our patients with regard to their experience. Um, we also want to take a look at the difference. So um, as an FQHC, we of course have existing quality and data measures that we track. Um, one of the big ones in behavioral health is we do depression screening. Um, so probably a lot of you are familiar with a tool that's called the PHQ-9. That's really commonly used in primary care to screen for depression and also track depression remission. Um, so we do a lot with that particular measure and we want to also take a look at, you know, parse it out. Does telehealth have a greater, a equal to a less than impact on um, depression, anxiety, um, et cetera, scores um, throughout the course of our project. Um, and then kind of as Steph and I know Kenneth will talk about, um, you know, really also seeing the comorbidity that we know exists between um, existing behavioral health conditions and chronic disease management. So things like hypertension and diabetes and, you know, cardiac um, disease, we wanna really, um, look, does, you know, our behavioral health services, whether they're telehealth or not, are we seeing better outcomes, right? Are we seeing differences in, um, you know, A1C levels, right? Are we seeing better compliance with our hypertensive patients, you know, with their um, medication compliances, you know, submitting their, their blood pressure reports and logs to their primary care provider on time? We want to take a look and see, um, you know, what that relationship is in a way that we really haven't been able to do prior to now. Um, so those are where our idea is that that's what's exciting to me, that's what's exciting to us, and those are the metrics that we're really looking to use to inform us along the way. So in terms of the population health, uh, collaborative, I mean, one of our uh, overall uh, goals is to improve these 
specialty care access. Um, that's a major challenge for many of our um, patients, um, at, um, tr trying to remove some of the barriers to care um, or to follow through to work with a provider. And we feel we can do so by, again, um, establishing or um, strengthening uh, a network of specialty mm -hmm. care um, providers on the South Side that will work with the five FQACs. Um, in doing so, um, we, we, we hope to address some of the clinical measures um, that um, um, health measures that's impacting our patients and really looking at three that we feel that have a, a, a significant impact on many of our uh, lives that um, receive care um, at our health centers. That's hypertension, diabetes, and asthma. And those are three areas that we definitely want to uh, address. And we feel in order to do so, um, having those subspecialty care providers um, being accessible, either working um, on site at um, some of our clinics, or we able to link them through hospitals um, or private practice in order to ensure that not only that we address the transportation issue or other barriers that prevent them from seeing a provider, but um, scheduling a timely um, appointment and a follow through to ensure that they not only meet with the provider, but also follow up with their PCP upon their return. Um, we feel that's very important, if, especially as you look at uh, population stratification and uh, specialty care intervention and management for um, our patients. And so our focus is really um, centered around looking at the data analytics, looking at how we can uh, look at trends and, and um, to understand what the gaps are, what the needs are, and how we help um, improve some of the workflows that have been established in order for us to um, help the, um, our patients to navigate um, the specialty care services. Do we have time for just one more question before it's time to wrap up? This question came from the audience and it's about billing. So the question is, should community health centers be able to bill for encounters delivered in mobile sites or should development of these programs be focused on unlicensed paraprofessionals, community health workers, care coordinators, et cetera? Um, I don't know, Steph, if you want to take this one first or if anybody else wants to chime in. We just have about two minutes. I will defer to my, my colleagues who are part of health centers that do billing. Um, I think one of the things I will just note um, is that when we talk about you know, mobile, mobile healthcare, one of the things, you know, we should be looking at exploring from a billing perspective is around community health workers and the value that they have in the provision of healthcare and how that service in particular could and should be um, billable for my, um, my uh, uh, colleagues on the panel here. I mean, you took the words out of my mouth. I think, um, you know, the long and the short is that, you know, it's the, the question is yes, to, or the answer is yes to both of the questions that Melissa posed. Um, I see Ken's nodding his head enthusiastically, yeah. So yes, I absolutely think we should be able to build, and I also think we need to find ways that, you know, those unlicensed care professionals, like the work that they do, can be reimbursable and billable in some way, even if they're not a licensed, you know, provider or professional in the way that we traditionally think of billable services. No, I, I just agree with everything that Jessica and Steph um, shared. I think their sentiment is point on. Um, we provide mobile health services. We have a practitioner um, that goes around and provide primary care um, in the community. But also you need the community health workers as well. Um, and I think they work hand in hand in order to engage the community into services. And so I, I, I think you can't have one without the other um, in terms of you need the building in order to sustain services um, for the care, but you also need the community health workers um, because they play a key work role as a liaison with the community, uh, following up with um, the individuals in the community and also providing with education um, and being a first responder for many, in, in many cases. So I, I agree, I think we, we need both. I, I can't select one over, over the other. 
Great. Thank you all. So um, this has been really great. I will wrap this up just with a quick statement about our evaluation work. Um, we're really excited to be part of this. So he is just honored to be at the table with all of these amazing pilot sites. And one thing that we have been very purposeful is while everyone here is very important, it's really the community that this is being built with for um, co-development is key. Um, and so we we are not saying this is community informed, it is community led. We have a minimum of two community advisory committees that are going to be built um, to really advise the, the fund for all of this work. So we're really excited to be a part of that, convene these groups and build an evaluation that will help us understand what impact that, that has. So thank you again to our panelists and our audience for joining us today. If you have any interest in joining us as a funder or have other resources to connect the fund to, please feel free to reach out to Rachel. Her email is up on, on the screen here at Michael Reese Health Trust. We'd love to have you join us. Um, so I will now invite Laura Starr back to wrap up today's program. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jackie, and thank you panelists for this really great conversation. We're really excited to see all of your projects and how they're going to help us increase access to all sorts of healthcare services that folks in our community desperately need. So on behalf of the staff, board of directors, and volunteers at Community Health, I want to thank you all for being part of our All in Chicago event series. I hope that you're all leaving today with ideas for how we can work together to make the vision of access to care for all Chicagoans a reality. We have four more events coming up throughout the rest of this month and they are all free to attend. I encourage you to check out our website, allin-chicago.org to learn more about the great events coming up and register to be all in. We all have a critical role to play in this effort. Thank you for being part of today's event.